Welcome to Category Theory, The Beginner's Introduction. I am Martin Codrington, and this is Lesson 1, Video 5 of 6. Last time, we completed our definition of S, the category of abstract sets and the arbitrary mappings, by discussing the identity arrow, the identity laws, and the associativity law. We saw that all three rules for data in the category, including composition, could be reduced to a diagram that must commute, i.e., all paths between two objects must be interpreted as the same map. We said that this will be a common strategy we will use in category theory, reducing ideas, formulations, and proofs to diagrams that commute. Today, we will be informally introduced to the concepts of duality and that of limits and colimits, and we shall see how these ideas are connected. But first, we need to learn how to calculate the number of maps between sets. Consider two sets A and B. How many maps can we form A to B? Well, let's just consider A0 first. How many choices does it have for its image in B? It could choose B0, B1, or B2, so 3. Let's make a choice, it doesn't matter which. Now to form a complete map, A1 must also make a choice. How many choices does it have? B0, B1, B2, the same 3 choices as A0. It doesn't matter which choice A0 makes, a1 will always have the same three choices. In other words, the choices are independent. There are three possible maps for each choice A0 makes and three choices. So there are three times three equals to nine maps from this A to this B. Let's represent the size or cardinality of a set as the kind of absolute value symbol of X, which means the size of X. So the size of A is equals to two and the size of B is equals to three. So we can say in general that there are 9 maps 2 to 3. And here they are. Now let's color differently the maps that consist of two clusters. Now what about the other way? How many maps are there B to A? Well, B0 has two choices, as does B1, as does B2. Remember, the choices are independent. So the total number of maps, 3 to 2, is 2 times 2 times 2 equals to 8. And here they are again with two different structures colored differently. In general, in S, the number of maps A to B is the size of B to the power of the size of A, because each A I in A has the size of B independent choices. So this is equals to the size of B times the size of B, the size of A times. Let's represent the number of maps A to B by the symbol the size of B to the power A, and say that the size of B to the power A is equals to the size of B raised to the power of the size of A. The symbol will remind you how to calculate it. So 12 to the power of 12 is equals to 8 trillion, 916 billion, 100 million, 448,256. We encountered this number when discussing the number of maps C to X. C we sent removed from our category. It represented the 12 pitch class names, but we said there were actually 17. And X is a set representing the 12 pitch classes. As an aside, the cool thing about isomorphisms is that they go both ways. Since the size of B to the power of the size of A represents the number of maps A to B, then all the properties of exponentials correspond to properties of maps between sets, including but not limited to their number. And all the properties of maps between sets correspond to properties of exponentials. We will see simple examples of this immediately, but to fully appreciate its significance, we will need to learn a bit more. For example, since we can represent all the maps between A and B as the size of B to the power of the size of A, then we can represent each map A to B as a point of a set of that size. Now you see the reason for the symbol. This is called a map object, or if you're from computer science, a function space. These are the objects I've spent most of my time studying. And in S, map objects have structure. On the surface, this is not surprising. There are different types of maps between sets but just how structured may come as a surprise. And there are natural relationships between map objects S to S and S to the class of categories that can be seen as structured sets. So F in set, we use the notation B to the power of A to mean B raised to the power of A. You will see how this generalizes and how we can take, for example, one graph raised to the power of another graph, one dynamical system raised to the power of another dynamical system. They represent the number of maps between those objects but also give much more information. But that's for the future. For now, on to the discussion of limits and colimits. Universal mapping properties 
are the name that we will collectively give to finite inverse limits and co-limits while we are first starting our exploration of S. Because that name will make the most sense until we formally define the concept of a limit, which is best done after we explore a few of them. But I will point out which are which, mostly because they come in pairs. Whenever we define a limit, we will immediately define the co-limit. These limits are what are called universal cones over a diagram, including the empty diagram as the first two we will discuss are, but for now we just need to have an informal discussion of a universal mapping property. So we'll say a universal mapping property asserts something about one or more objects with zero or more maps between them in relation to all other objects X in the category. A universal mapping property is an object P that may or may not have relationship to a diagram of some sort. The principle is that there's only one map between P and all other objects X in that category, with X is either the domain or co-domain of that map, such that P and X obey the restrictions. In other words, that the diagram commutes. This will become more clear with examples, and we will redefine the definition later. But the basic idea is this. If you can show that your object has this property in relation to all objects in the category, then you can have the confidence to begin reasoning with and exploring the consequences of that universal mapping property without worrying about if your reasoning will be affected by other objects in your category. I remember, when we were discussing the number of maps between sets, this number gets very large very quickly, and it's nice to be able to create these objects such that only one of the possibly trillions of maps will connect another object to it in a useful, structure-preserving way. The universal mapping property also gives you clues as to how to define that one map. This is precisely why, with category theory, you can model dependent aspects of the system separately, then connect them in the end. This is how I generally work, and how we will be working with music. We will model harmony separately from melody, separately from rhythm, then connect them all together in the end. For melody and harmony, we just need to make sure we start from the same set X of the 12 pitch classes. And for rhythm, well, a note is rhythm with a pitch, so we can build up notes from these formulations. Everything will be an object in the same category, so using universal mapping properties, we can reason with and formulate with them separately, and be confident in the conclusions we make. Let's start by defining one. Usually we will go limit then co-limit, but this time around let's start with the co-limit, the initial object. Definition 1, 1. In any category C, an object 0 is said to be an initial object of C, and for all objects X in C, there's a unique C arrow from 0 to X. So in this case X is the co-domain, and there are no restrictions placed on 0. There's just a unique C arrow from 0 to X for all X. Let's restrict this definition strictly to set. Definition 1 1 restricted to S. In S, a set 0 is said to be an initial object of S, and for all sets X in S, is a unique map 0 to X. We could have said initial set there, like we can say initial directed graph, initial permutation, but I just use the generic initial object for all categories. So we need a set 0 in which we can only form one map 0 to x, no matter the x. Remember we said that the number of maps a to b is represented by the size of b to the power a, which is equals to the size of b raised to the power of the size of a. So this equation, the size of x raised to the power of 0 equals 1, must hold for all x. In other words, we need a number such that when any other number is raised to the power of this number, the answer is 1. Well, the symbol gave it away, right? The initial set is the empty set, because any number raised to the power of 0 is 1. And now you understand why. But how do we picture this map 0 to x? Well, let's say that we have b equals to 3. Here is the map graph of 0 to b. There are no objects in 0, so the map consists solely of isolated vertices, 0 clusters. You may question, is this fair? Is this really a map in s? Well, the definition of a map says that each element in the domain must be assigned to exactly one element in the codomain. But there are no elements in the domain, so we're done. We didn't not form a map. We didn't violate a rule. So we must have formed a map. That's how binary logic works. Think of it this way. If you hired someone for the day to answer your phone, all the calls you received. At the end of the day, if you receive no calls, you still have to pay that person, right? They didn't not do what you asked them to do. This initial object in S will become important to us later, especially when we construct new categories from S. But note that while there's a unique map 0 to x for all x, there are no maps x to 0 unless x is 0. 
This is because from the definition, we need to assign every element of the domain to an element of the codomain. But we can't satisfy this condition unless there are no elements in the domain, because there are no elements in the codomain. And this is why 0 to the power x is equal to 0 for all x unless x is equal to 0. In which case, 0 to the power 0 is equal to 1. Another property of exponentials that makes sense by considering them as the number of maps between sets. The reason we know this unique map 0 to 0 is because that's what definition 1 1 tells us, right? It says that for all x and s is a unique map 0 to x, and 0 is an s, so it must have this property too. This will factor into our proofs about uniqueness of this object in the next lesson. The real reason why I wanted to define this universal mapping property now is because I really wanted to define and begin using this tool, the terminal object, as soon as possible. This object will make our life so much easier. So let's discuss duality and use it to define the dual to the initial object. Duality is one of those concepts in category theory, and there are so many. But at first it seems magical. You're like, I can do what? Just like that? But when you learn the real reason behind it, you're like, oh, well, that's obvious. It's common sense. We're going to start with a utilitarian definition, so we can immediately use it to define the terminal object. It's been so hard talking about sets without the terminal object. I can't wait until we define it. Then I'm going to give a sketch of the explanation as to why it exists. But enough of a sketch that you'll understand why we can do what we can do. So what can we do? Duality, the utilitarian definition restricted to S. Whenever you define a universal mapping property in S, to get another universal mapping property, just do the opposite of what the definition says, which usually involves reversing the arrows, and you'll get another UMP for free. Just add a prefix code to the original definition and you're done. You'll see that with products and coproducts, equalizers, coequalizers, but sometimes we give each a unique name, like the co-terminal object is the initial object. Pullbacks and pushouts are another example of when each has a special name. Every day is define one, get one free day in category theory. Let me illustrate with definition 1, 1. Let's make definition 1, 2. And by the way, the co-prefix works just like a minus sign. So we are technically defining the co co terminal object, which cancels the gifted terminal object. Let's use the symbol T for now until we find out what it is. Okay, let's just copy and paste definition 1.1 1, 1 and edit it. The in any category C part is fine. Now let's substitute T for 0 in both places and terminal object for initial object. The for all objects X and C, there's a unique C arrow we want to keep. And now I'll do the opposite, i.e. reverse the arrow. And let's switch the order of the domain and codomain to how we usually write it. So now our new definition reads, definition 1, 2, draft. In any category C, an object T is said to be a terminal object of C, and for all objects X and C, there's a unique C arrow, X to T. Now let's restrict it to set. Definition 1, 2, draft, restrict it to set. In set. A set T is said to be a terminal object of S, and for all sets X and S, there's a unique map X to T. So we need the size of T raised to the size of X to equal 1 no matter what X is, i.e., what number when raised to the power of any other number is equal to 1. 1, of course. 1 times 1 is equal to 1 times 1 times 1 is equal to 1. And we can see why. Because no matter the size of X, we have to take each element of x to the unique element of 1. So we get a size of x cluster for each map x to 1. When x is 0, we get a 0 cluster. When x is 1, we get a connection and 1 cluster, etc. So let's update the definition of the symbol 1 for both the general case and the case restricted to sets. Here's the map graph for 3 to 1. I know you'll probably find it hard to believe right now, but the terminal object is the object that we will use the most as we explore S, and you will grow to love it. It will help you to understand all future definitions, which is why I wanted to define it now. You know you found a good mathematical theory when it allows you to perform algebra on your definitions to produce new ones. But duality at first may seem strange and non-mathematical. Reverse the arrows, stick a co in front, a co-co cancels. Well, let me give you the explanation as to why this works. Remember when we were discussing a map f from a to b and s, we said that for all a and a, there had to be some b and b for which f of a was equal to b? 
Well, that is how you've seen functions defined in algebra, analysis, and pretty much all of mathematics for all your life. The reason why, it's much easier to think and talk about maps from this perspective, i.e. from the perspective of A. But what about from B's perspective? B is just as good as A. What if for every map f from A to B, we define a map f op from B to A, where the op superscript stands for opposite perspective, not opposite map like an inverse? This map is the same map, just from B's perspective. So how will we define an f op map in general? A valid f op map can be defined as follows. A map f op from B to A assigns to each bi and B a subset ai of A called the splitting of bi, defined as A is an ai if and only if f op of bi is equal to A, such that for all A and A, there's exactly one AI such that A is in AI. Do you see now why we define maps from A's perspective? It's so much easier to talk about. But let's picture this by looking at the components in an FOP map B to A. First, we'll take the components of F map and see how we can change them to form the components of an FOP map. Well, an isolated element stays an isolated element, and a connection stays a connection. We just need to reverse the direction of the arrow in the connection. But a two cluster becomes a two splitting because one element splits into two. And a three cluster becomes a three splitting because one element of the domain B splits into three elements of the co-domain A. So we can call maps in S cluster maps and maps in S op splitting maps. Splitting maps and cluster maps, although they describe the same information, are not compatible. We couldn't compose a splitting map with a cluster map in general. So we can't include these maps in S, unfortunately. However, we can form a new category that is the mirror or opposite category to S, SOP. SOP has a special relationship to S. For every object of S, there's a corresponding same object in SOP. And for every S arrow, F from A to B, there's a corresponding SOP arrow, F op from B to A. It is one of the exercises at the end of this lesson to define SOP, the category of abstract sets and arbitrary splitting maps, and prove that it satisfies the laws. But notice that we can do this for any category C, so we can form C op for any category. More on this in the future. But to understand duality, we need to look at calculating the number of maps in SOP. We saw that we could calculate the number of S maps, F from A to B, with a simple calculation because the choices for each element of the domain were independent. The calculation is not so simple with SOP maps, because each choice is dependent on the choices the other elements make. But they both must add up to the same number. Let's calculate the number of maps 3 to 2 in SOP. We already know the answer should be 9, but how do we systematically determine that? Notice that ideally, each element of the domain in an SOP map has three choices for a map into the co-domain 2. 0, do nothing, 1, connect, or 2, split into 2. This corresponds to the subset AI of A in the definition. A has three subsets. The empty set, do nothing, set with one element, connect, and A itself, 2, split into 2. Those are the only three choices. But if we go through the list of elements in B in some order and ask each element to make a choice, the choices of successive elements are limited by the choice of the previous elements, because each subset assigned to a BI has to be a partition of A. If we want to partition 2 into 3 parts, our only options are 2 plus 0 plus 0 and 1 plus 1 plus 0. That corresponds to the two abstract structures possible for maps. 3 to 2 in SOP. It's the same as asking, how can I add three natural numbers together to make two? Notice that if SOP maps were created by each element making a choice in an order, then the element that chooses last has the least options. Actually, that element has no options. It must do exactly one thing. It must either split into the leftover elements of A, or do nothing if the other elements have already split into all of A. Let's see this in action. In calculating these number maps, we will represent the size of the subset that f op assigns to each b0, b1, b2 as the triple size of a0, size of a1, size of a2. In our case of 3 to 2, 
in SR, we'll let B0 choose first. It has three choices. Let's say it chooses zero, do nothing. Then B1 has three choices still. It can choose to do nothing too, in which case B2 has to split into all of A, a two split in. But B1 can choose to connect to an element of A, a one split in, in which case B2 can only connect as well. And if B1 decides to two split, then B2 has no choice but to do nothing. What if B0 chooses to connect first? Then B1 only has two choices, do nothing, in which case B2 has to connect, or connect, in which case B2 can do nothing. And lastly, if B0 chooses to two split first, everyone else can only choose to do nothing. What this analysis does is move up one level of abstraction from the abstraction of the three types of splittings to how these three types can be distributed among the three elements, which add up to six ways. Now, if we notice that in every distribution that has a one, there are two ways to make such a map. Take, for example, one, one, zero. Notice that f up of b0 equals a0 and f up of b1 equals a1 is a different map from f up of b0 equals a1 and f up of b1 equals a0. So we have 1 plus 2 plus 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1 equal 9 maps 3 to 2 in s up, which is the same number of maps 2 to 3 we calculated in s. Thank goodness. And if we rearrange the sum to match the choices that B0 makes, we see we get 4 plus 4 plus 1. It is interesting that the number of maps in s up is given by a sum, whereas the number of maps in s is given by a product. And we'll see exactly why when we explore sums and products and map objects in lesson three and four, I believe. Notice that in SOP, we can more clearly see how our abstraction of component types builds up to the abstraction of component type distributions, which builds up to actual element assignments to form real maps. And I can't overstress how important SOP will be to us in the future. In everything from map objects to permutation to combinatorics, in general, there are some things that are easy to reason about in one side of a category and harder in the other. Sometimes we will reason S up and then convert to S because it will be easier to do so. And we should always take the easiest path. For example, the process we just completed can form the basis of any number form relations. The elements of the codomain could represent necessary tasks to be completed, and the domain could represent an ordered set of employees, tread pools, and the functions represent the different ways that the task could be split up. Or the codomain represent packages that must be delivered to a particular location A, and the domain possible delivery routes from a specific location B. Many such maps could exist for all locations in a category, and the objective could be to maximize efficiency while minimizing costs. We'll see how we can do just this in lesson five. There are three obvious generic strategies in ordered assignments and maps in SOP. However, the first is early assignment, where the objective is to have the splittings cover A as early in the assignment process as possible, i.e. the first BI in the order takes as much task as possible. Late assignment, which could deal with the distribution of resources, where each BI is told, take one only if you need one. And this can be as complex as you like. You can take the choice of each BI into consideration with past history, etc., etc. And of course, you can choose a special point of X to be last in the order, where the special point doesn't actually consume any resources. We're actually going to develop a system like this in discussing one of the many possible uses for one of the few non-distributive categories we'll study, the category of pointed sets. And three, the final generic strategy is equal distribution, where the aim is to have as few isolated elements as possible, but also to minimize the split number of each split. This is one obvious advantage of looking at maps in S the other way. In S, order doesn't matter and choices are independent. In S, order matters and choices are not only dependent, but the number of choices decreases to zero at some point before assignment is complete. But now back to the terminal object in duality. Definition 1-2 says that T is a terminal object in any category if there is a unique map X to T for all X. We already figured out what T was in S, it was the one element set. Well, since S up is a category of its own, let's figure out if it has one and what it could be. 
Remember, the definitions don't say that the category has one, it just says that if it does, then it has a special property in relation to all other objects in the category. Well, remember maps and SOPs are splittings. So this definition says that all sets can only be split one way to the terminal object, T in SOP. But wait a minute, T can't be the one element set in SOP, because if X has two or more elements, then the first element has a choice of whether to do nothing or to connect. So there are two maps, two to one in SOP. So one is not the terminal object in SOP. The only way there can be only one map in SOP to an object is if all elements have one independent choice, i.e. if they all have to do nothing. Remember we saw that once all of A was split into, then the remaining elements had no choice? So the only way to guarantee that all the elements of B have one choice is if there's nothing of A to split into. In other words, the terminal object in SOP is zero, the initial object in S. Similar reasoning will show that the initial object in SOP is one, the terminal object in S. Because the one element set only has one choice, no matter what the set X is it maps into, it has to split into all of X. And this is why we have duality. The moment we define a concept with a universal property, because the nature of maps in the opposite category are usually very different, the object that satisfies this property will have to be different too. And since that object exists in both categories, then that object must have an equivalent definition in the other category. As far as the terminal object goes, some of you may be thinking, okay, so we understand duality, and why the initial object implies the existence of a terminal object and the converse, but it's still a one element set. Why is it interesting that every set has only one map into it? Well, as we shall see in the next video, it's not the maps into one that give it its power and utility, but the maps from it. So, see you then. Thank you.